So along our topic of lessons learned, and as I say, uh, as I've been using as a theme throughout this session, uh, where the various, you know, the journey of uh, starting with a computer science education might lead, uh, we've seen journeys that have been, you know, 25 years in progress. And we're going to contrast that with one that is five years into progress. And it's a very interesting idea, the, the difference in perspective and things of lessons learned to come five years out from your education as opposed to 25 years out and how things change and yeah. how we view the uh, important aspects of what we learned here while in the department at uh, UNC. And our next speaker will be uh, Mark, uh, Mark Nyer, and actually uh, he's adopted Christine's last name, Zuba Meyer. Uh, Christine, uh, hi, Christine. So then they're relatively new uh, uh, graduates of the department, but it's interesting to find out where life has taken them and the life lessons. So I'll let Mark talk. <clears throat> My name is Mark Schuneier, and this is a talk about empathy lessons learned in distributed computing. Steve Jobs compared the computer to a bicycle for your mind. It could take you farther than you could get on your own. When I came to Candidates Day in the spring of 2007, we were told that computers are like power tools for your mind. They'll let you build things that you couldn't build otherwise. Now those are both great metaphors, but in my experience, the best metaphor for the computer in my life would be that of a mirror, in which I saw a reflection not just of my own mind, but of the minds of the people around me. Through my work in distributed computing, both theoretical and applied, and my incessant focus on the P versus NP problem, I learned how to empathize. So I came to Carolina with a mission. My goal was to prove that P equaled NP. And for those of you who are unaware, this is an open question in theoretical computer science. And it is one of the most fascinating questions people have ever asked one another. Now, I could tell you what P is, and what NP is, and what the relationship between them is, and what the question is asking, and most of you would probably be bored by the end. It would be possible, but it would take a very long time. So rather than tell you what these things stand for, I'm going to tell you how they feel. Because one of the main things I've learned in life is that transferring emotion is a very high bandwidth mode of communication. So there are things in life, you may be aware of these, where if they are presented to you immediately in front of you, you can recognize it. Happiness is a great example of this. When I feel happy, it's not really a question of like, am I happy or am I not happy? The answer is very obvious. But it may be hard to find the thing that when it's right in front of you, you know you have it. So I could read a list of statements to myself and then know immediately, is this funny? But coming up with a list of statements that's gonna make somebody laugh, finding it or constructing it is substantially harder. Most theoreticians believe that being able to recognize something right in front of you, that's what NP stands for, doesn't mean you can find it. I, for whatever reason, was convinced that all the theoreticians were wrong and the fact that they couldn't prove it was because they were wrong and not merely because that they simply hadn't found the answer. And so I came to Carolina with this goal. At Candidates Day, I think it was Henry Fuchs suggested that I should get some money to work for somebody over the summer before the school year started so that I could get to know the campus, get to know the town, get to know the people. And this was really great advice. I got money to work for Jim Anderson on a problem in real-time systems. Now this wasn't P versus NP, but it was theory. And it also dealt with parallelism. I could see pretty early on from my time in Carolina that the age of processors continually getting faster was coming to an end. And instead what we would see was an increased number of cores on a single chip. And so it seemed that learning about parallelism would be good for my career, even if it had nothing to do, or so I thought, with P versus NP. So during the days, at first I worked for Jim Anderson on a problem in real-time systems, and then later it was with Rob Allen and Alan Porterfield and Rob Fowler at Renzi doing some practical work on multi-core systems. And at night, I would dream about P versus NP. <laughs> Only I didn't realize at the time that that's what these dreams were. An example would be, I'm going skiing with my friends and we had to pay money to go up ski lifts. And then we would get paid depending upon which slope we would go down. And it was my job to make sure that the entire group stayed on budget. And <laughs> while I'm in this dream, I was trying to find the answer. Like what set of routes can people go down? that will make them happy, that will keep us on budget. And I would be stressing out, well, these two people can go down there, but then she has to go over there unless he goes this way. And I would be trying to find the answer. And it would be very stressful, and I didn't want to wake up. 
Another example of this dream would be, my family's all about to go on vacation, and I'm trying to get packed. I have a suitcase and a whole bunch of objects that I would like to put in the suitcase, but they won't all fit. And so I would sit there in a the dream trying to figure out, well, what if I put these objects in, then I'll have all that covered, but I might need this. But if I take this one out and put that one in, then these ones won't fit. And it was a couple years of having dreams like this over and over and over before I finally saw the emergent pattern, which was that I was focused on a mathematical problem instead of being present with the people around me. Now, if P equals NP, as I had suspected the whole time, it may make sense to try and solve the problem. But if the problem is actually completely unsolvable within a reasonable time bound, maybe I should have just said, screw it, it doesn't matter what I pack, I'll just go on vacation and be with my friends and family. Or it doesn't matter what routes we go down, everybody else will take care of it themselves. Realizing that dichotomy, the main thing that jumped out at me was that, yes, I was ignoring the people around me for a possibly unsolvable mathematical problem, but the people could have helped solve the problem. If my friends had said, these are the routes we want to go down, here's what we plan on doing, they would have been presenting me with a possible solution, and I could just verify, yep, that works, or no, maybe, but we'll have to try something different. In the case of the vacation story, instead of me trying to find the set of items I could pack into the suitcase that would work, they could have just said, here's what we are bringing, and I could go down the list of what everybody else was doing and just verify that it worked. So at that moment, I started to see that NP is really, it's about people. It's about being with other people in my life, and that, in a sense, having a large distributed computer system, which is effectively what a quantum computer is, is a very parallelized machine. There's some caveats, and the theorists would be upset, but roughly speaking, that works. Having a large parallel system is like having a lot of friends to work with you on a problem. And this was a big deal for me, because I was used to thinking of people as indecipherable black boxes that behaved in arbitrary manner. <laughs> so I had to turn on my engineer hat and look at people from a new light, as, oh, maybe we're all operating in something like a distributed system. And maybe I could learn something from the people around me. So I started looking for parallels between human interactions and the algorithmic systems, which I was very familiar with. I saw a couple of them, and so this will begin the technical portion of our talk now. The simplest example I have of an algorithm that is parallel both between computers and human beings is that of a flocking algorithm. So in a computer flocking algorithm, you can get very rich demonstrations of behavior of things like schools of fish or flights of birds using three very simple rules. So the first of these rules is that you maintain minimum separation. The fish don't get too close to the other fish and the birds don't get too close to the other birds. The second rule of a computer flocking algorithm is that you match the average local velocity. This is what allows the whole school of fish to pivot on a dime to get away from a predator, or all the birds to turn immediately to go towards something tasty that got dropped on the park ground. They match the velocity of the other agents in the crowd that are relatively near them. The last rule is that you move towards the nodes which are furthest away. And this mechanism gives the flock or the school some coherence, it prevents it from spreading all over the place. Now when I read about this, I thought this was pretty cool, and so I immediately asked myself, does this apply to people at all? Is there any way that people are doing the same kind of thing? And it turns out they're basically following the exact same algorithm, but just slightly different terms. This is just personal space. I can't come up to you on the street and be like, hey, you should adopt this crazy theorem that I have. It is vitally important that you adopt my theorem. Even if I really believe the theorem, I'm violating both your physical personal space, but also your intellectual personal space. In our culture, we very much believe everybody has the freedom to believe whatever they want. And as long as you're not trying to project it too intensely on somebody else, that's fine. The second rule here, match average local velocity. Let's just go with the flow. Everybody was telling me this as a kid, and if they would have said, look, you should maintain the average intellectual average velocity of your Voronoi region, it would have made total sense. <laughs> but they <laughs> but they use this bizarre archaic reference of like flow and like what is that? But it makes sense. If we're all playing poker and everyone's talking about poker and I'm going on about a space elevator, this is not an appropriate topic of conversation <laughs> in the local context. The final rule here about including everyone, this is just the human sense old drive for diversity and inclusion. And we've seen over the past couple thousand years, the notion of personhood, the notion of rights and dignity has gradually been expanded. And you could see that maybe this is about keeping us coherent, so if a big predator comes along, we'd all dart away, like a school of fish. Predator would be like an alien or something, perhaps. <laughs> so another example here of the the, uh, the parallel between human systems and parallel and distributed com computational systems is that in distributed computing, we have this notion of the Byzantine agent. 
And a Byzantine agent is a node that is actively trying to work against the goals of the rest of the system. So if you have a distributed database, a Byzantine agent may be trying to corrupt the records of a database. You also have the notion of an agent which is faulty. It's not trying to corrupt a database, it's just not working right. And what I've noticed is that a lot of human systems, we actively look for and label agents either as Byzantine or faulty so we can ignore them. And if you look at all these three rules here, if you violate any of these, it no longer matters what hypothesis you're trying to advance on people, it gets rejected because you're not following the flocking algorithm. So if you deviate too far from the average local intellectual velocity where you are, and you try to sell people on some crazy advanced idea, even though it may be the right thing 300 years from now, it is not currently 300 years from now. It is always currently now. And this presents a problem for people. So let's, let's look at another famous distributed systems theorem. This is the Gandhi algorithm for social change. Gandhi says, you should be the change you wish to see in the world. So if we formalize this, given a distributed system with current state x and you have a desired state for the system of y gandhi is saying that you should move in the direction y minus x so for example i'm not a fan of pollution i don't like cigarette butts all over the interstate medium according to the gandhi algorithm what i should do when i'm on the freeway if i see any cigarette butts is stop my car in traffic get out and pick up all the cigarette butts now everybody in the room may be in agreement that we should not have cigarette butts on the medium of the freeway, but there are priorities, there are relative things that matter. And so I think Gandhi, you can't fault him, he didn't have a background from Jim Anderson or other distributed systems theorists, he missed a scaling factor. You should be the change you wish to see in the world, but you need to scale it down so that you still fit in. You can't get yourself labeled as a Byzantine agent or somebody who's faulty, because then people will disregard everything you're saying because you're not with the program, you're not going with the flow, you're violating personal space. So the, the final example here to, to fit into all this stuff together, you may be familiar with double buffered graphics. A lot of people at UNC worked on graphics. This is a very well-known technique. So when a computer is rendering an image, it has to do it pixel by pixel. So the processor is writing values to memory, and it writes these values to memory sequentially. So while it's building the image, if we just showed this thing straight on the screen, we would watch the thing get constructed, and it would look odd. This is a graphical phenomenon called tearing, and people find it unpleasant to look at. So what the solution that people came up with was to have two buffers, one of which is always displayed to the screen, and one of which is being worked on in the background. Once the, so this is be for an animation. When the last frame of the animation is completely rendered in memory, this gets displayed on the screen. And the next frame would be built pixel by pixel here. Once this frame is complete, we swap the buffers. This one gets displayed on the screen, and this one becomes used as the working space for the next image under construction. Now what you may not know is that this algorithm was originally proposed by Jesus in the year 30 BC. It was published in the Proceedings of Mark, chapter 12, verse 17. These Pharisees ask him, hey Jesus, should we pay our taxes? And he says, why don't you give me a coin? They bring him a coin. He says, whose image is on the coin? He, they, oh, this is Caesar's image. And what Jesus says is, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God's. Well, Caesar, I think in this case, is the front buffer. And I think what he was saying to the Pharisees is, yes, you live in the world. You have to follow the rules of the world as they exist right now. You have to pay your taxes. You need to render a stable, consistent image that is fit for public consumption in the public space that you're demonstrating it. You have to pay your taxes. You gotta go with the flow. You can't get labeled a Byzantine agent. But the flip side of this, the other side of the coin, so to speak, is that you are made in God's image, according to Jesus, and so you should render yourself to God. The back buffer, which is your thoughts, your will, your volition, and the world you wish to see under construction, that isn't fit for public consumption, but it's not being consumed by the public. Your thoughts aren't being monitored all the time, so in your imagination, in your will, in your heart, you should see the world that you really want it to be. When you're driving down the freeway, you don't need to stop the car and get out and pick up all these cigarette butts, but that doesn't mean you need to tell yourself that it's okay for them to be there and it's fine and we should just leave those there. You can still believe and want and wish and hope that eventually someday the highway mediums will be clean and free from all that. 
So that's the, the final idea here is that you do need to play along with the game in public, even if you want to see a world which is dramatically different. If you think the world is dramatically unfair right now, I suggest that you don't stop the car, get out of the freeway and pick everything up. I tried that for a few years and it did not go very well for me. But now that I've, I still have an image of a world I want to see, which is dramatically different from the one right now, but I do my best to keep it under wraps. And this is probably the most outrageous thing I've done in recent years. So a final note, say you do want to advance the public buffer. You want to change the world and you want to do it in a positive way. You may find that you have some extra coin and I suggest that you don't give it to Caesar. Caesar has all the coins he needs and is busy making more. You could give it to the Carolina Department of Computer Science so they could take some more kids through on May's Day. Or maybe pay a grad student to detect cancer in early childhood. So I apologize if I've offended anybody by advancing this Jesus hypothesis here. I'm not sure how I feel about it myself. But what I do know is that this department is doing work which is enriching and benefiting the lives of everybody in the community. And that's an algorithm which scales beautifully. Thank you. I would be thrilled to come back and give such a talk. <laughs> yeah, I actually have some comment about the, the, the Gandhi and the sure. thing. Right? I mean, it's kind of, uh, if you look at both the life of Gandhi or the life of Nelson Mandela, they were very far ahead of their time. Uh -huh. And, you know, you had to, they had to kind of wait, in Nelson Mandela's case, you know, you had to wait 30 years in prison for the world to sort of catch up with it. Mm -hmm. And finally, it became obvious that was the only way to do so I don't know if, if, if they hadn't been out there that, you know, what would have happened with the world. I think Gandhi moved the Overton window, but we, we can't have a world full of Gandhis. It just it doesn't scale. Like, you can have a couple Gandhis, and I think that works really well, but if everybody's doing it, I think everybody would have taken it in their own... Like a corollary here would be like nonprofit groups, for example. If every nonprofit group has a huge endowment that they're using to support themselves, and then they all have a tiny like delta vector of the way they're trying to change the world, it ends up possibly just slowing it down because you have all the money in the endowment maintaining the status quo, and then tiny little bits of it pushing it this way or that way. So I'm I don't mean to criticize Gandhi or claim that oh I know better and he should have scaled it down. I'm really glad he did what he did, but the thing is I can't I can't be Gandhi. Like I, I, that's not an option. I have to take care of myself day to day, I think a lot of people feel the same way where they would like to see dramatic change in the world. So maybe the, the goal was to give hope to people there where they feel like, I want to see the world better, am I the only one? If that, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm really dumbfounded by this whole talk and in a way it gives me a, a, a new frame of reference, but that's not to say that it's, that it's just alien to me because um, you know, I recognize a lot of it, and if I really simplify it, it comes down to, I can't change everything, but I can make a difference. I dig that. I mean, that that's been useful for me to, to see it that way. No, I, my, I gave this walk, talk three or four times to my wife to try and prepare. It was only last night that she said she finally understood what I was trying to say. <laughs> was I had to take out everything that didn't directly go to the point. It was that parallelism is hard for the same reason that getting lots of people to work together is hard. And I originally had some other examples from distributed systems where I, like, to me, the cap theorem is difficult for the same reason that maintaining consensual reality is difficult. And the, 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 the cap theorem, it puts a limit on what you can do with a distributed system. You either have to sacrifice availability, uh, consistency, or the resistance to network partitioning. And the way I view the world, it would be hard to unpack this in a brief period of time, but it just seems like there are so many lessons from distributed computing that apply to large groups of human societies. And in a way, I start viewing war as like a network partition on the network of consciousness, as like we couldn't agree on what the invariants were, and then we had to have a war so that we could agree that this was terrible, and at least gave us something. A war is like everybody agreeing to agree that that was an awful experience, and we should not do that again. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let's get lunch. Thank you again.